This is Dr. Bess Miller, and I'm here with Dr. David Bell. Today's date is August 30th, 2017, and we are in Atlanta, Georgia at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am interviewing Dr. Bell as part of the Oral History Project, The Early Years of AIDS, CDC's Response to a Historic Epidemic. We are here to discuss your experience during the early years of CDC's work on what would become known as AIDS. Dr. Bell, do I have your permission to interview you and to record this interview? Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. For this oral history of AIDS at CDC, we have been focusing primarily on the early years beginning June 1981 with the publication of the first MMWR on the five cases of pneumocystis carini pneumonia among homosexual men. David, you were one of the principal epidemiologists at CDC to work on the infection control aspects of HIV. And for the area of HIV infection control, focusing on risk of transmission and strategies for preventing transmission, I guess the early years continued through the 80s and into the 90s. Starting in 1987, when there were limited data on risk of HIV transmission, and healthcare workers were afraid to care for patients with HIV infection. You provided leadership in this area and served as chief of the HIV infections branch once this branch was formed in the hospital infections program in the National Center for Infectious Diseases until 1997. Of course, you then went on to provide leadership in many areas, including antimicrobial resistance, influenza, and prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV, collaborating with the World Health Organization and other agencies. You also provided leadership in emergency response activities, most recently including serving as the scientific lead for CDC Ebola virus response in 2014 and 2015. But let's begin with your background. Would you tell me about where you grew up, your early family life, and then where you went off to college? I grew up in Philadelphia. It was uh, in, inside the city. Um, it was uh, in a neighborhood um, with, with many immigrants, uh, primarily Ukrainian from Eastern Europe. Um, I went to a large public high school of 4,500 students uh, in the next neighborhood over, which was a German neighborhood. Um, most students in that high school did not go to college. In fact, the overwhelming majority did not. Um, but my, my parents, favored and impressed on me the value of education and I was lucky enough to be good at my studies and worked hard and I got a scholarship to Princeton uh, where I went to uh, school for undergraduate training. Who or what influenced you to go to medical school and, and where did you end up going to medical school? Ah. <sighs> Well, um, I, I, I was always interested in science. Um, in college, I majored in physics. Mm. Um, um, but I, 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 it's kind of a combination of factors. I, um, uh, physics was taking too much time. I liked other topics, humanities. I actually spent a year in between junior and senior year in college and go, going to school in France and studied philosophy. And I came back, I decided I wanted to be more involved with people than in a physics laboratory. And so I, and I also took a biology course, which was fascinating. And it just kind of shifted me off to to medical school seemed like I could actually do something useful, meet lots of different kinds of people. And, um, and I was lucky enough to go to Harvard Medical School, which mm. was a completely wonderful experience mm. for me. I enjoyed much more than college, actually. So 
then you went on, and what did you decide to do for residency after medical school? I, um, I, w I did a pediatric residency um, at uh, Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, then I came to CDC um, 1979 to 81 in the Epidemic Intelligence Service program here. Uh, and since, incidentally, I, I remember being one of the earliest people in the loop in June 1981 because I was in viral diseases and responsible for uh, cytomegalovirus, which was cultured from the initial patients. Uh, and so I was sort of in the loop. And I just said, well, this is a very common virus. We don't know what this means, which, of course, was true. So I, I heard of AIDS at the beginning. What, um, how did you decide to go to the Epidemic Intelligence Service? Oh, well, Alexander Langmuir, uh, who, as you know, was kind of God at CDC. Things are named after him. He's quoted reverently. Um, he was the director of the infectious disease block during my second year of medical school. Uh, this was unprecedented at the time. It was usually a microbiologist who was director of the block, and, and so he assembled lectures on different topics. But he would always, for, for every bug we learned about, he would describe an outbreak mm. that, you know, and, and so I, I, there were actually three people in my medical school class who went to EIS, and it, I think it was Alex Lang. Plus, there were a lot of EIS alumni around who just had wonderful experiences, you know, to, to share. Wow. And just, That's was, different. Yeah, it was great. What were you assigned to? You mentioned viral diseases. Uh, what were you assigned to, and, and what did you work on during EIS? So 79 to 81, I, um, I was assigned to a variety of things, but my, my main area, and it was a, a, a mysterious illness called Kawasaki disease, which um, um, was described by a Dr. Kawasaki in Japan, and it's a, a disease of young children, uh, fever, rash, and a variety of other symptoms, and but about one percent of them um, actually develop heart attacks during mm. due to coronary aneurysms, and the cause of it was completely unknown, still is. Um, but during my EIS time, there were two large outbreaks in the United States, and there had never been outbreaks, or, well, at least not in the United States, and so I got to mm. work on that, and there was, you know, it was quite interesting. Didn't, didn't find the cause, but we at least ruled out a lot of things, and w which was helpful at the time. Mm -hmm. Then I went to do an infectious disease fellowship at actually at the University of Rochester, which was the site of one of the outbreaks. And so I got, you know, I, I discovered I liked the program there and those people. And, but eventually I, I came back to CD, well, eventually it would be 1987. Uh, Why did you come back to CDC? Um, I, I realized uh, after Infectious Disease Fellowship I had an academic job, which what I'd always aspired to and decided I didn't like that. This was, I didn't really like academic medicine. I then, you know, we didn't know what to do. Just bought another house, just bought a house, had another baby on the way. And <laughs> we weren't gonna just move for no reason. Um, so I, I worked as a general pediatrician for three years, which actually was enormously helpful later. Because um, I understood then what it was like to be the end user of CDC recommendations that would oftentimes tend to get written and, you know, for better or worse, somewhat of a ethereal environment with, mm -hmm. but I knew like this, mm -hmm. you know, it's, what am I going to tell a parent actually, mm -hmm. you know? So, so that was quite helpful. And in 1987, um, I got called by um, a former colleague at CDC and asked would I come back and, and, and work on AIDS in the hospital infections program, be the AIDS that? coordinator. That was Dr. Bill Jarvis. Uh -huh. um, 
and and the the reason this all happened there was a there was an uproar this was in the, the 1987, uh, major national uproar. It, three healthcare workers had gotten HIV infection, n not from needle sticks uh, or sharp instrument injuries contaminated with blood. That that was previously documented. That that was known to unfortunately be um, occurring at a steady trickle. But this uproar was three healthcare workers got. HIV infection from getting blood on their skin or what we call mucous membranes, like in, you know, on their mouth, eyes, um, and um, these were also, I'll just say, outside the main AIDS uh, cities of New York and San Francisco. This one of them was in a midwestern state; they didn't have much AIDS, mm. uh, and 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 this this. This particular one uh, j just was holding a gauze pad uh, at, the, at the site of an arterial puncture. This was in an emergency room. A patient come in to be resuscitated, had died, had gotten arterial blood, and she was holding a gauze pad. And then it, did, it was discovered he died of AIDS, and she was documented to have gotten infected as a result of this. And, you know, there was another um, person who was um, a f filling a, a, a phlebotomy tube. The tube fell off and it splattered in her face. There was, there was another one who was uh, f fixing a, some s tubing that was clogged up and blood. So, so, so the combination of, you know, you, you, you can get this awful disease from just holding a gauze pad with your finger, uh, p p plus the fact that this was now in, you know, throughout the country, AIDS, and, and this, this was sort of, this is the mid-80s, it, it, the, the, the background for this was that the, the cases were increasing with no end in sight, and were spreading throughout the country, so people even, you know, and out Outside normal places were starting. I mean, not outside New York, San Francisco. Were starting to get worried about, it. and then you get well. There was there was an uproar, and so um, I was recruited to come back and um, kind of take the lead in dealing with this. Big assignment. Mm -hmm. So around by then there were about fifty thousand patients reported with AIDS, and this was not the days of reported with HIV infection, but, but the disease. And the majority of these people were dying. Um, yeah, there was no treatment. That's the other thing that's important to know. This was before any antiretroviral drugs. I mean, the, the, you, this was a death sentence. And it was a horrible death, a slow, horrible death. Um, so the idea that you could get this from holding a gauze pad, you know, somebody on that, that was just amazing. So um, now CDC had had done a, a case control study looking at, you know, what were the risk factors for? No, not yet. No, that was later. We we did that. Uh, let me uh, let me tell you what what. So, so the question was, you know. When I got back, um, when I came, um, what is the risk to healthcare workers, and what can we do to reduce this risk? And there was very little known about this. Um, for, for one thing, it was a very multifaceted question, let me just say. I mean, there are a lot of different kinds of healthcare settings and healthcare workers. There's outpatient, inpatient, there's emergency department, there's surgery, there's obstetrics, there's the wards, there's the laundry room. I mean, we were getting laundry, laundry workers with needle sticks because they found, you know, a syringe was in the sheets that were sent to the laundry. I mean, there's all, there's all, all different settings. What, what, was, what was the risk of getting infected from which fluids? What about the cumulative risk if you had to, none, none of this was known. And then how to reduce these exposures to, to, to prevent them. Now, we, we, 
We didn't know what the risk was. We, we had some information to suggest that it, it, was, it wasn't huge. I, I mean, there were AIDS surveillance data that showed uh, some, some number of cases of AIDS in healthcare workers who said they had no other risk. Um, but they didn't have documented exposures. They were mostly men. We knew healthcare workers were mostly women. And that none of them were surgeons or anybody who you would think what, you know, would actually might get stuck. So, Was we, there a thought that perhaps these people were men who had sex with men or drug users? Absolutely. Okay. And just so weren't how can reporting we rule that out? it. And, yeah. and that was a major thing. We did, however, have from aid surveillance. Um, it was a handful, but it was worrisome. It, there, were, there was, a, let's just say, a steady trickle of very well documented situations where um, some, there was a documented exposure, HIV infected blood, needle stick, whatever it was. The person tested negative then, zero converted. It was a very well documented. This, this, now, again, there weren't like, you know, it was, it was a handful, but it was increasing and the epidemic was spreading and we were worried. Um, so, and, and one of the biggest fears at the time was that th these reports might might have been a tip of the iceberg type phenomenon. I mean, HIV infection, you know, go for years with no symptoms. And um, at the time, you know, the other thing I have to say, health, blood exposures were, were just were so common, they were thought to be unavoidable. I mean, this was normal, uh, you know, for, for uh, when I went to medical school, and, you know, certainly, well, for centuries before that, you know, you get some blood on you, so what? You wash it off. Even needle stick was a nuisance. I mean, nobody, we had no idea how many needle sticks occurred. No, nobody reported. So, and, and they were thought to be unpreventable, thought to be unavoidable. So our job was to find out the risk of infection, how the frequency of these at different kinds, I and mean, then what are the circumstances that increase and decrease the risk, and how do you prevent them? So. One of the, the big concerns at the beginning was the, as I mentioned, the tip of the iceberg effect. And, 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 and this was coming from, well, let's say a lot of concern, uh, 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 a lot of concern was, oh, I forgot. There's one other thing we did know, uh, we did know, uh, which was the risk from a single needle stick exposure was of getting infected with the HIV, uh, exposure to HIV infected blood was three in a thousand. How did you know that? Because CDC had started early, um, around 1982 or three, uh, it, 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 collaborating with a couple hundred hospitals around the country to uh, prospectively, as we say, enroll workers who reported these exposures, mm. tested negative at time, had documented exposure, and then how many uh, zero converted. We knew that the risk was 0.3%. And this, actually, there were smaller studies in place at San Francisco General Hospital and at the NIH Clinical Center that also found the same. So those so, got going once, once you could actually Measure zero conversion. No, no. Actually, it was before that. Oh, these how, were, how did they do that? No, but well, that's a really good question because because these were patients with AIDS. A healthcare worker got um, stuck, and in the beginning, all we knew was the patient had AIDS, and the the healthcare was just the healthcare worker was just followed to see whether they got sick or not. I mean, that's the best we could do uh, in the early 80s. Now, in 1985, when the antibody test um, became available. Then the patients could be tested, and then the workers could be tested. But yeah, that's a good question. So, so, so basically, we, we didn't think the risk was huge, but there was a risk, 0.3 percent. And I'll, I'll just I'll just say one other thing. You know, even how that risk was described was was polemical. I, I mean, um, both we got criticized for describing it as, you know, high or low or what, mm. because, you know, 
it wasn't as high as hepatitis B. A similar exposure might be 30 percent. But on the other hand, three in a thousand of fatal disease, not exactly low. And there were people who accused us of concealing the risk to healthcare workers. The government, CDC, is concealing the risk to healthcare workers because they don't want healthcare workers to be afraid to take care of the patients. Mm. And, and then there were people, there was one actually very loud, outspoken orthopedic surgeon, who, the congressional hearings, you know, what the government's hiding from you, CDC is concealing the risk to us. The, then there were people who, you know, weren't that extreme, were concerned some healthcare worker unions in particular, they were understating the risk. We were understating, which could lead to a false sense of security. And, and then there were people on the other side who were concerned that there might be a perception of exaggerated risk. These tended to be maybe um, uh, AIDS activist groups and, you know, even like people in healthcare who you had to manage situations like there were situations where, uh, you know, we had dietary workers who, who would who would leave trays of food on the floor outside mm -hmm. the patient's room. They were afraid to even enter the room, you know, much less draw blood or something like that. So, so these they were very uh, concerned about how we even described the risk that we couldn't quantify that well. Mm. Um, so anyway, in this environment, um, uh, we were a after these um, 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 three. We called them the splash cases. That 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 was the the moniker. Uh, one of them wasn't a splash; it was just holding gauze pepper. Anyway, so CDC that was a big universal precautions. The blood and certain body fluids of all patients to be considered infectious, and precautions should be taken to avoid contact. So gloves, to avoid contact with blood, goggles, masks. Um, for, Tell me a little bit about how that was delivered. Now, was that a recommendation and report in the MMW? Order? Yeah, it was. A, well, there was a big consultants meeting. You know, getting expert advice from. And who would who would be on such a meeting? Oh, meeting? there were a lot of there maybe sixty. 60 um, infection control experts from around the country, uh, stakeholder groups uh, uh, who, who you know had important perspectives to contribute, um, public health officials with some experience in you know managing a recommendation at a local level, say mm -hmm. for example, and. Uh, there were a lot of questions, you know, should patients be tested? This was like the first, should all patients be tested when they enter the hospital? Well, the, kind of the outcome was, you know, basically that wouldn't really solve the problem uh, for a couple of reasons. One of them was a lot of these were, you know, happened in emergency departments where they came, came in, need to be resuscitated. You, there was no way, there was no rapid test in those days. You, you, and so, and also, it would only be as good as the most recent test result anyway. And so, so the, the decision was universal. We're just going to, well, to people who thought blood exposures were inevitable. And, and particularly, I would say the surgeons had a problem with this and the orthopedic surgeons. Because in truth, for Sharp, to prevent Sharp's industries, we didn't have a lot to say. We said things like, be careful and don't recap needles by hand because you might stick yourself and dispose of them properly. But the surgeon said, look, you know, we, we, we got bone fragments in the, that we're operating on. We, mm. we, we have bone saws that aerosolize blood up. I mean, we mm. are careful, but this is, we can't, do, you know, it's, and, and, and anyway, so, so the orthopedic surgeons were, there was one particularly outspoken, the government's concealing and all this kind of stuff. And so to address the tip of the iceberg phenomenon, we actually started with the orthopedic surgeons. And before you get there, yeah. um, was this the first uh, recommendation of universal blood and body fluid precautions, which sounds kind of like a watershed event in clinical practice? It, it I mean, they didn't have that for when hepatitis was right. of a concern. 
This was a huge deal. This was a watershed, 1987. Now, now actually, b before that, there had been a category of infection control precautions called blood and body blood and body fluid precautions. Okay. So for example, in, in, uh, patients with hepatitis, if, if they were known, were blood and body fluid precautions. In 1982, CDC recommended that patients with AIDS and uh, uh, other conditions that seemed like they were you know, going to become AIDS, the blood and body fluid precautions apply. And, and this was the, 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 the same thing I just told you and about. What, and what um, how did universal precautions differ than what was in 82, the blood and body fluid precautions? All patients, regardless of whether they're known to have an infection transmittable by blood or not. All patients. Actually, in 1985, CDC had come out with a you know, recommendation for that, but it wasn't well publicized and didn't get much. of This was 1987 with the splash cases. You know, okay. This was front page headlines. What are we going to do about this? All blood is infectious. That was everybody. And then the question was how to implement that, and these exposures were happening anyway, particularly the needle sticks. Okay. So, but, so, so there, were, there were several categories. You, you know, one was the risk, and then there was the exposure prevention. I'll get to that in a minute. The, the tip of the iceberg, I have to tell you about this, because it's just such a, an amazing event that happened. The, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, God bless them, this was a courageous move. They agreed to co-sponsor with us an anonymous zero survey at an annual meeting. Now, it took three years to get this arranged, to get all the permissions and from that organization up in Washington. We had to get permissions. I mean, th this was an era when, y y you know, a lot of people were very afraid about what a study might show. And so sometimes they were reluctant to, you know, let it be done, but eventually. What, we, what might it we, show that there's well, homosexuality? No, oh no, um, well, no, no. But 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 let, let's just say that there was this huge iceberg. Let's say that you know, 25 percent of orthopedic surgeons were were infected. Well, that would have been a complete nightmare for the country, for all health care. For there would have been pressures to have them disclose who was. The, I, I mean. All healthcare workers would have said, "You see, you know." We're, uh, so, 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 but, but on the other hand, the unknown is ultimately worse than that. You have to punch through this and get the answer, because then you, you don't know where to target your prevention efforts if you don't know <laughs> what the risks are. So, so anyway, what happened? The, the annual meeting was in Disney, Disneyland, California. Disneyland Convention Center, and there was this. We had this enormous white tent in the parking lot. And the, in the tent were dozens of um, anonymous counseling and testing uh, stations, counseling testing booths. It was all anonymous. The surgeons would come in. Actually, it'd be quiet during the. The meeting and then during breaks there'd be waves of them and we, we'd have to tell them you know turn over your badge turn over your badge because we're con so they get anonymous counseling testing they get phlebotomy linked by barcode the tube to their fill out a questionnaire about risk and what did what did the counseling um, how long was that counseling session and what did it involve at, at the time th this was the, the, there's no nothing much to offer people well I, I, this was like the, the recommended you know, CDC, like counseling and test, like before anybody gets counseled, you, you know, you have to be sure they understand what they're doing here and what HIV and what results, what what options are available for you and what, even if you test negative, if you're engaging in risk behavior, you, 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 you should stop doing that because just because you tested negative now doesn't mean, and then once you test positive, well, to get into care. I mean, this was, this, this was pretty well. Um, and and we, in 87, was there any care? Was yeah, there any well, actually, the, it didn't really come until, it actually didn't actually happen uh, until 91. In 87, okay. no, there wasn't, but it took years, I said, to get permission. So, and, but, but, but it had to be anonymous. You see, there was an innovation here 
that normally counseling and testing, like in local health department, the counselor knows your result. But, but here, we didn't want anybody. So, so the innovation was they got counseled and tested for both, I'm sorry, they got counseled for both positive and negative results. They didn't have to reveal the result. The, the counselor said, if your result is positive, if your result is negative. I mean, so they didn't, and, and, the, and the testing, you know, normally testing with the confirmatory testing in those days, it, it took time. So we had, there was a local laboratory. There were, there was, the tests were done around the clock under supervision of CDC lab people who went out there to, to, to like supervise this. So the next day, so tubes of blood had come off. The next day, you go out with barcodes with results. And the whole thing was, you know, sort of organized bedlam. I mean, people running by with walkie-talkies. You know, in those days, we had walkie-talkies to communicate with each other at the other side of the tent, for example, and phone calls from Atlanta and Washington, how's it going? There'd be reporters who were denied entrance to the tent. Some of them pitched a fit, but no. This is where we could, you know, it's the, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons said, you know, this is our tent. You know, if it had been the government, it would have been harder. They said, no, you know, it's a private organization. So it was, anyway, at, at the end, there was something like 3,400, in four or five mm. days, 3,400 surgeons got anonymous counseling and testing. There's about half of the surgeons there. It, nothing like this had ever happened. And only two were positive, and both on their anonymous questionnaire had reported other risk factors. So this, like, people breathe huge sighs of relief. I mean, I, I can, you know, it didn't mean that they, they weren't at risk and that there wasn't, you know, still work to be done here, but it, it, it did a lot to dispel this kind of tip of the iceberg, you know. And then we could get down to work. Okay, what, what are the known events and the real risks without having to worry that there was all this. That's so amazing. It, it was totally amazing. Um, and I give them a lot of credit because it took courage. It took that organization courage to do it. How did you manage this? Did you have most? Mo did you have a group of people in your own yeah. shop that helped oversee this? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was a joint project. I mean, there was somebody. Um, there were people in in our uh, branch. Um, uh, the director of it was uh, per, uh, an epidemiologist, Dr. Mary Chamberlain, and, um, and there were also other people, you know, very closely. There were lab people, but it was our, you know, it was it, it was a it was a good. How, how did how did that? Um, sometimes program and lab don't work as well together, but it sounds like this one did. Did was oh, there a yeah. lab? Oh, it was Charlie Shabel. I mean, he was the serology. I see you smiling because he was, you know, a legend. I mean, he was in charge of the AIDS uh, serology lab at CDC. He was the one who went out there and he and his people made sure that that local lab did it right. Oh. And, yeah, so it, it was... Uh... Were there any state involvement in that or was it directly federal and um, professional organization? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I recall somebody from California State, well, well certainly they were, inf you know, informed about all this, but it, no, it was really us and, mm -hmm. and the, because these people were coming from all over the country and, mm -hmm. well, you know, yeah. the convention happened to be in California, right. but it wasn't a right. California thing. So, That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, well, the main thing, I don't, I don't know what you're organizing, I, I, we, we need to talk about the exposure prevention stuff, Please. because that's, yes. you know, okay, so, so, so there's the risk, then there's the exposure prevention. So we, we started, you know, as I'm, exposures occur in all different settings, and so we implemented, um, observation studies in, in operating rooms, uh, obstetrical departments, emergency departments uh, around the country. We had and what is that? Uh we had observers like watching 
a surgical procedure recording various information, not, not the patient's name or anything like that. I mean, this is all anonymous, but recording when, when surgeons got stuck uh, or, or people in emergency departments, they'd walk around and watch things happening. Cause see, is this a standard hospital infections um, procedure for other diseases? Was no. it then as no. well? What are the risky procedures? Back then, there was no objective quantification of risky procedures. I mean, you had people anecdotally saying, oh, you know, I get stuck all the time. We get stuck all the time, or we get, and there was no, there was no quantification of this. There was no description of the circumstances, the risk factors to get some rates and, you know, get some idea of, you know, how often and where do we target interventions. And so, so this was, this was uh, a, a, a extremely helpful. We did them. We did these studies in um, big city hospitals. We did them in suburban hospitals. We did them outside the, uh, both inside and outside the high city. The, you know, places like New York and Los Angeles, and to, to try and get some idea. Like in a study like this had also been done in San Francisco General Hospital. Um, this was Dr. Julie Gerberding back then when she worked there. Um, but that hospital had a lot of experience dealing with AIDS patients. We, we needed to get a sense, you know, more broadly about how often these exposures occurred around the country in different kinds of hospitals. So well, how we, would that work if you were, let's say you were one going to observe a surgical procedure? Um, would, would you have a, a checklist of things you want to look yeah. for? Mm -hmm. we, we gave them... Check, we gave them checklists to fill out, and if something happened, describe this. You know, if it was a hand, wh wh which finger, um, non-dominant hand, or what? Just what happened? And, and 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 another thing that turned out to be really important later, when we started talking about risk to patients, and I know we're going to get to that. How often, like after the surgeon um, got this injury? Did the, did, did the needle recontact the patient? Mm. In other words, what was the potential for exposure of the patient to the surgeon's blood? Mm. And, and some of this was during bone, it was maybe already in the, or the surgeon would just keep on suturing, kind of say, ah, keep on suturing. We actually found that about it, it, it was a third of the time, a third of these injuries that, that somehow the patient was also exposed. Mm. Now, this, this, this became important later when we started talking about risk to patients. But it, it cer certainly, it, it, at this time, it was the, you know, how do we prevent the, how do we, there were technique issues, like it turned out that certain procedures were riskier, certain techniques, if, if, the, if the surgeon held the tissue being sutured with his fingers as opposed to an instrument, we, we could demonstrate the mm. increased risk that, you know, some of this is like in retrospect, well, of course, duh, you know, but, but, but this is, you know, at the time, these techniques were historical, nobody really cared that much, and it took like, no, you need to, well, well, the surgical societies, I will say, when we published this result, they jumped on this right away. Like, this doesn't happen anymore, this kind of these things. They, these, these, these procedures have really gotten a lot safer. But, but the, the biggest problem that really, the most intractable, that wasn't very susceptible to observation, were the, the needle sticks that occurred during phlebotomy and, uh, you know, vena, like getting blood from a vein or an artery. This, this occurred all over the hospital. Many different uh, pe doctors, nurses, medical students would do these things, clinical lab people. And, you, you, you know, you really couldn't, you couldn't observe. So, so we had to, like, try and rely on reports. And it still was like, how, the, and, and the, the documented, occupational infections were actually not coming from surgeons. They were coming from phlebotomy. And mm. so this was the real problem. 
And the insight to how to deal with this came from an injury epidemiologist at the University of Virginia, Dr. Janine Jager. Jager? Uh, Jager, yeah. And it, it, this was like a couple years later. She had the insight from that perspective that these syringe needle devices were inherently unsafe and also were used for many um, tasks that you didn't need a needle for. So, so for example, what would happen was um, somebody uh, would, would draw blood into a syringe from the patient's vein or artery, and then she, well, I said she, these, these were actually almost all women that this was, um, would, would then transfer the blood from the syringe to, into, into a glass tube. Mm -hmm. Tubes were glass and, and they had rubber stoppers. And so she would have to apply, you know, pressure to get through the stopper with this needle in this syringe full of blood to transfer the blood into the tube. And yeah, sometimes she would miss and jab herself or squeeze too hard and the tube would break. And, and these, we had like, it was like a, you know, steady growing stream of these types. This was how people were getting infected. So, you know, with this insight, I mean, eventually, and then the unions picked up on this, and OSHA and Congress even passed laws requiring engineering controls, was the phrase, safer needle devices. So nowadays, um, to transfer to transfer blood from what, it, it's plastic. You, you don't use a needle for to transfer blood between tubes anymore. I mean, that's ridiculous. Or, you know, we used to, like holding pieces of tubing together, you'd stick a needle to connect a tube and a t a t IV tube. I mean, this is ridiculous. And, and also the, the, the needle, the syringe, it's, it's um, it, either the needle is recessed or it, the needle that actually gets into the patient, there are devices now, for example, this is one example, they have a, a sliding sleeve that, uh, that you push from behind forward, it covers up the needle tip and locks into place. So this needle is now disabled. It's never going to stick anybody anymore. Mm. Yeah, but that, that you know, that, that's how really, this kind of thing is how, that's a, that's how those problems were solved. That, that took a while. That, that's, yeah. So CDC, it sounds like, did quite a few studies as well as um, academicians, and you mentioned mm. San Francisco General Hospital and elsewhere. How, how would, was that a, a natural flow? How was it decided what, what studies CDC would take on? And oh, what? well, let me just say, we, you know, we worked collaboratively. We depended on, on, on people in hospitals to actually do that. So we gave them funding. Okay. to do this, but we, we coordinated, organized the study, and, um, you know, had designed the protocol, and then we were blessed with, like, wonderful people to collaborate with us, and it, it became a joint venture. So when I say CDC, I don't mean it was just us here, sitting here in Atlanta. I mean, there were people out in hospitals who were actually getting this done, and it was very And, and how, how, how did that work in terms of collaboration and managing and yeah, you must have had periodic meetings with sure. all the investigators. The, the multi-center studies were complicated. I mean, you had to get, you know, we might have half a dozen hospitals doing one of these observation studies and they had to follow the common protocol and, but, 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 but it worked. You know, we had dedicated, uh, I mean, um, conscientious people out at work who very much wanted the answers to these questions just like we did and um, they got support from their institutions to go ahead and do it. I mean, so, so. would you have, for example, in your uh, branch or division project officers for each of these study yeah, sites right. yes. who would go out and yes. Yes, and, uh -huh. and just, you know, make sure things were going right and everybody was informed. We'd bring, bring the, the, the investigators from these hospitals to meetings in Atlanta where we'd all share experiences and 
plan the next improved study and okay now what do we learn and that and what's the next step I mean this was it was all very interactive now in in some um, some aspects of the AIDS early years there was a lot of competition um, among you know high level academicians in terms of getting those first New England Journal articles out and um, did you experience much of that in this arena? Because this was a pretty hot, hot stuff. Yeah, it's hot stuff, but it wasn't, there weren't that many people doing it that, um, I mean, occasionally something like, occasionally an issue would arise. But in general, uh, in, in AIDS research, this wasn't considered hot. Like the okay. hot stuff was the virus, the community. The, the, this was of interest, of huge interest to um, hospitals, healthcare workers, and it was hot for them, but there wasn't, I, I, I'd ha, I, I don't rule out that there might not have been somebody who wanted to, you know, get published something for, but that, that wasn't, that wasn't a huge problem for us. There weren't enough of us to compete with each other, really. Um. So, also CDC, in terms of trying to get it at risk and prevalence of infection, did some seroprevalence surveys. Um, Right. That, that was, that was the, not the under biggest your one unit. was the orthopedic surgeons one that I, I, I there were also some uh, smaller ones in um, uh, dental society annual meetings that mm -hmm. were um, you know s s s somewhat along that line. The, the, the real other problem that I'll just if you allow me to jump ahead a little was the issue of okay once somebody does get exposed then what do you do? Um, we call this post-exposure management. Mm -hmm. um, so the years we're talking about now are still sort of the late 80s, 80s. Yeah. before there's a real solid antiretroviral regimen. Yeah, I, I mean, no, we had e even the mid a even the mid or early, you still had to know what to tell the person, how, how long to um, um, follow up. The antibody test became available in 85, so how long after do you need to get tested and what should you do in the meantime? And, um, you know, the, the source patient should get tested with consent. What if he didn't consent? What should you tell? And, and this, was, this, this was, well, both in terms of the scientific unknowns, like we didn't, it became clear that most seroconversions, when they occurred, happened within the first six months, actually the first three months, but then there would be reports of delayed, like nine months, very well documented. Does that mean everybody should get followed for a year? This was hugely distressing for the exposed workers, as you can imagine. I mean, there was no cure for this fatal disease to say, say your risk is only three in a thousand. Well, you know, if it's you, um, and, and we'd say, well, during this follow-up period, um, safe sex, don't donate blood, so safe sex, that means we're telling women not to get pregnant. I mean, most of these people were women in childbearing age. So if you tell one, okay, for six months, don't get pregnant, and then she gets another needle stick, okay, another six months, don't get pregnant. Or sometimes they already were pregnant, which was totally terrifying for them um, in terms of the, the baby. and so, so there were lots of gut-wrenching <laughs> stories here. Um, and then, then AZT was, the, this was the first, it's called Zaydavidin, um, licensed in 1987. Uh, the NIH Clinical Center decided they were going to make it available to their workers. I mean, nobody knew if it worked or not for post-exposure. The NIH decided they were going to make it available anyway, even though they didn't know any better than we did if it worked. But then, so as a result of that, questions came from around the country. Well, if the NIH is doing it, you know, shouldn't we do it too? And well, but but the drug had side effects. Uh, I mean, 
we didn't know if it worked or not. I mean, there's issues about how, how to implement that it has to be given like very soon. The worker has to, I mean, so we did have a, 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 a meeting and came out with recommendations, of, you know, I guess it was the late 80s or something like that about, we don't know if it works or not, but if you're gonna use it after exposure, after here's some considerations, these are the toxicities, the doses, this is what you should be watching for. But the question was starting to burn, you know, does it work post exposure? Because I mean, remember we were now, there are other exposures too. I mean, we were getting questions that tended to come to us because we were getting questions about rapes and um, sexual exposures. We, we, had to, we had to find a way to assess this. And, you know, the advantage, I say the advantage is sad, of a, of a needle stick injury is that you, you know exactly what happened, when it happened, uh, many details of the exposure, you know, the source patient, you can follow, you can document. For sexual exposures, you're relying on history, you don't know really what happened or how many times or who else or anything like this. But this, this and, and these, these exposures and infections were continuing to occur, so we just had to figure out a way to like assess this. Now, the, 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 the study design that you're supposed to do is to take um, workers who get exposures that come and report, and then you randomize them. Like you give, them ha you give half of them uh, the drug, uh, Zydabudine, you give half of them placebo, and then you follow them for a year or whatever and see what percent, compare the percentages who acquire this awful fatal infection and see if there's a statistical difference. <laughs> well, you know, the, 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 the Burroughs Welcome Company, um, the, maker, uh, the maker of the drug, they tried that. I mean, it, they, they tried. Uh, but the problem was that a healthcare worker who, who got a needle stick, like, they didn't want to be randomized, they wanted the drug, you know? And, um, um, and so all, in terms of ethical yeah. review board, would somebody pass uh, a, t a, would that type of study design have passed? Yeah, because it, nobody knew if it worked or not. Or, or you know, or could have. Yeah made it more likely to, I mean, you don't know. When, when you don't know, you don't know, you know? Uh, so uh, it, it passed, but, but so the, the, the two problems, the healthcare workers, you know, didn't want to be randomized, but also since the, since the baseline risk was only three in a thousand, in order to demonstrate a, what we call statistically significant reduction in, in that risk, we would have needed thousands of healthcare workers, just from the pure math statistical, to do the comparison. So the, the company tried, and after a year, they only got 84 workers willing to enroll, mm. as opposed to the necessary thousands. So this wasn't gonna work. So we had to figure out something else to do. And what, what we eventually figured out was this isn't kosher. I mean, you don't, this is, but there was no other way, and there was a compelling need to figure out some way, is that we took reports of occupationally affected healthcare workers reported from AIDS surveillance, well-documented, you know, whatever it was, needle stick, test negative, source patient, well, well-documented cases. These were the cases. Um, a couple of them were in our prospective surveillance projects of in these couple hundred hospitals of healthcare workers who got um, um, uh, exposed and then followed. But most of them were, were just documented at the needle stick. In other words, it wasn't retrospective. I mean, they were well documented at the time the needle stick they reported to occupational health. Got, so there were well documented cases. With, and the controls came from our, what we call the needle stick study. This study had been going on since about 1982 to, to see what happens if they 
you know, well-documented exposure and continued. Most of them didn't get infected. So taking the cases and controls from like two different data sets mm. and two different methodologies is, re is really not, you know, but there was nothing else to do. And we had great statisticians who like did the best they could to make sure that there wasn't, you know, some biases creeping in. And we also methodologically thought like, could we have like, no. And they teased out what's called confounding variables. Cause yeah, the more, the more serious, in the mind of the healthcare worker exposed, the more likely they may have been to report and, we, and get the, but, but statistically that was, I can't totally explain, but it was very well done. Who and, was the and, statistician? Uh, Dr. David Culver um, uh -huh. was in the hospital infections program and he was, and, and um, the, the person who was the lead for this study, um, actually we, we recruited later that she took over the study. She recruited her from Brazil, was like a great, she's American citizen and also Brazilian, and she now is the chief. It's Dr. Denise Ricardo, who is, then became the, the director of the, you know, the, this division. And it's one of the best things I ever did at CDC was get her to come and work for us and our branch. Anyway, um, but this showed, and these, these results, this took a while to do, and the results were published in, I guess, the tail end of 85. It was during the government shutdown, and we're all shut down, but the MMWR published this, and there was a statement from the CDC director that these, these, the public health uh, urgency of these results is such that despite government shutdown, we, we have decided to publish this even though were shut down, and it it and later they were published in in the New England Journal of Medicine a year or so later, maybe a year and a half, something. Like that. And so the comparison, basically, the comparison of the health, with with needle sticks, the, the the comparison of the the, the healthcare workers got infected didn't get infected. Basically, it was larger volume of the source patient's blood involved. Um, the source patient was closer to death, which at the time, particularly these dated from the early 80s, the best we had, we, we thought that this was, this represented high viral titer. You know, they were close to death, no treatment. So this makes sense, more blood, from the source patient, higher viral titer, sicker patient, and very convincingly, what reduced the risk if they got AZT, the drug post-exposure, mm. re re reduced it by 89%. It was statistically significant. And so this, so we had a consultant's meeting, we had people come around, and they all said, this is it. And so we mm. recommended then issued public health service recommendations. This came out in, I guess, maybe 1996. Um, when, what types of exposures, since we had known from, you know, which were riskiest, what types of exposures drugs should be recommended versus offered and versus not recommended and, and also not this drug anymore, but the the whole load of the newest drugs, like people just went, the, the virologist, the AIDS, somebody said, no, we're not, the, you know, this old drug's an old drug. We, we got, we're using like the newest ones now, including this one, in case there's some reason only it works, but we're gonna add the others for the most serious exposures. And it, it became, so now we, we only- now you, excuse me, you mentioned um, that that came out in 96. Yeah. And, um, the the data from the original needle stick study were ready in '85, something like that. Well, it was ongoing. Yeah, it, it continued. Uh, I on. mean, it, yeah. I mean, this was a surveillance project right. called Study in the Quite. We, you know, yeah. these were monitoring people who got exposed. But so, that's a long, long time. What what were you recommending to people during all of those years? In terms of post-exposure right. prophylaxis, we did have a statement, like I mentioned in the, in the late 80s, that um, 
Oh, well, maybe you, it was maybe it was early 1990. But see, Zydovian came, you know, was available in '87. So by '80, and, and the NIH started offering it maybe in '88. And the question, so like '89, '90, we we said we don't know if it works or not, but you might want if you use it. Here, here's like how to use it. Here's some things. So so that that went along for a while. And I'm reminded of. ACT UP and uh, I don't know whether uh, Union 1199 for the healthcare oh, yeah. workers and so on. Um, was there, how did, how did you interface with them during this period of we're not sure if it works, but maybe it works? Is the drug widely available? Was, was were you a part of that? Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, they, they were totally support. I mean, they knew, you know, on, on an issue like this, which was really was a medical scientific issue, not so much a political issue. The drug was available. We weren't saying don't use it. We were just saying we, we don't know if it works, so we can't recommend it. So was that, was that an issue of controversy? Because we know there was a lot of controversy over why is the government not providing more AIDS drugs and you know people are dying? Um, and so here you were sitting on, a, it was an issue I think that CDC has frequently had to deal with, which is we don't have quite enough data, but uh, we have a great demand. Um, but this was very different. These people didn't have, it. their risk of getting infected was three in a thousand. So, 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 so these weren't like, um, people with AIDS dying because they didn't have access to the latest experimental drugs. The, 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 these, were, these were people who the, the overwhelming likelihood was that they were not going to get infected. Mm -hmm. And just if you wanted to reduce that risk further, okay. you could take this drug, which was by that time widely available. So no, we, we had other issues with, <laughs> with these advocacy groups. Um, that I, I, I get to in a minute, but this, on this particular one, no, we, it, 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 they, it, this wasn't. We, we, it wasn't an issue. Yeah. Um, you again, there, there was a, there's a long time period we're discussing it, it, here, but yeah. do you, do you have a sense about how many healthcare workers were infected during? That decade, are we talking hundreds? No, no, are no, we no. Talking dozens. Dozens. Yeah, including around the world. I mean, there, there were. You know, we developed close collaborations with um, colleagues, uh, particularly in uh, France and England um, and Italy, uh, who had, who were wrestling with these problems too. Um, and that the well documented cases. You know, my memory slips. I mean, it, you know, might have gotten, it probably got into the hundreds after a while, but it wasn't. Okay. This was in the, by the late 90s. Okay. I mean, now, now, you know, they would have had to have been documented and reported. I mean, this was the problem. You, people have to go, they have to, they have to go right after the injury, test negative, uh, the patient, and then they have to get followed, then it has to come to, the, so, so it also has, this all has to happen. I mean, it, that was actually see, one of the concerns that I was talking about that tipped the iceberg thing, like, you know, a disease where you might not report your blood exposure and you don't have symptoms anyway. But so, so the true number is probably higher than that. And I'm not even talking about places like Africa where they didn't, you know, where the infection control issues are completely different. And But, but just... But it was, en you know, it was enough to be a worried about. A serious worry. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, the interesting thing that I, I just found very interesting is that after, you know, this, this somewhat unorthodox methodology for the study that um, found um, efficacy of zidobutene post-exposure after neostics, well, for this a year or so later, the Public Health Service recommended this for non-occupational exposures too, right? for sexual exposures, um, and there and and now it's then it became recommended by WHO, and there's never been another study like we did. 
I mean, a combination of impossible, maybe unethical. So it's this study from needle sticks that is the basis for all the post-sexual, you know, it's it just it sort of interesting. And this is not, you know, people came to us for information about, uh, we've been talking a lot about blood, but what about the other body fluids? See, we had exposure information, uh, risk information on, oh, you know, like other, like urine, and people would be asking about saliva and sweat. So, so in a sense, we, even though our focus was healthcare workers, the, the information we gathered was useful to, to uh, you know, colleagues and dealing with other questions too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so we were, and we learned from them, of course. And so it was a, it was a, it was a great team at CD. I know you were part of it there. I mean, AIDS in the '80s. It was when I came. When I came back in 1987, <clears throat> oh, there were lots of legal issues and confidentiality and all. Oh, just, I mean, we, we, I know we're going to get in a minute to the to the risk to the patients from the dentist, where this all just kind of exploded. But um, when I first came back in 1987, we had a, a an issue. There was some legal issue, and I had a meeting in the head CDC lawyer's office, Gene Matthews. <clears throat> and uh, I walked in, my, my boss um, um, in introduced me, and he, he just looked at me and said, welcome to the pit. <laughs> and, and that's right. It was, you know, it, there were some days it felt like combat. I mean, you, you, we were getting, like, you know, like, um, ranked out from people who said we were, you know, taking instructions from the gay lobby. And then there were others who were like, we were, you know, kowtowing to the conservatives in Washington. And, you know, we, we were trying to just like put one foot ahead of the other and try and get more data. <laughs> and it, it, it was, um, it, 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 I've not seen this. I've been at CDC now for, I don't know, 32 years, and there was nothing like, and you can't even describe it to people. I mean, the, the, it's hard enough to deal with scientific uncertainties about a virus and what you should do about a virus, you know. And sometimes there are political issues, you know, like influenza, you know, or the, who's going to get the, you know, or the border control. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm not saying, but... But there was there was nothing like AIDS, where, where where people were scared and they're you know had competing versions of morality even sometimes and was there, we, a, was we, there <laughs> just were you dealing with a lot of stigma against gays and drug users in terms of trying to assess the problem or trying to document things what. What were some of the, what was some of the causes for this Sturm und Drang that you described? Well, I, I mean, people were, uh, people, people were afraid, uh, with with very legitimate fears. I, I don't mean. I'm sorry if I implied that these were somehow, you know, inherently unreasonable people. I mean, but. People were afraid. Um, the uh, gay people, with you know, who had a lot of infected people in their community. First of all, they they were they were afraid of, of losing their loved ones, dying. <laughs> they were afraid that that they would become ostracized, and when they needed medical care, they wouldn't get it. Okay. I mean, they saw that. I told you about the dietician who would leave the thing. I mean, so so they were, so so so, so they were afraid. We had other people on the other. I don't mean to say the other side, but I mean a lot of times it sort of mm -hmm. were also afraid that you know of blood of of doing their job. You know, going going to work and get infected on the job. Like this is. A, not something somebody and that you know and if what's the CDC doing about this and if we were if they even just worried that we were 
you know, not doing something right or doing something that might kind of exacerbate the things they were worried about. I mean, they let us know, you know. Mm. And it wasn't always very polite. And the politicians would get involved, too, and start How was that? Shouting how, at us. how, um, either federal or state politicians, this was sort of the Reagan era and then a little bit after that. Um, yeah, what were was some Bush. of the tensions you got there? Well, The issue about testing or not would come up, um, but in order to really get the full flavor of that question, I, I, I think it would be better to bring up the, to move to the situation of where the dentist transmitted to the patients, because that's when the public really got alarmed and the politicians all right. So if, Let, if let's let's move to that yeah. um, sort of watershed case. You were involved in a lot of watershed issues. Um, the so-called Florida Dennis case. Right. So maybe can you introduce us to to the case itself, the circumstance? Yeah. So um, this was in 1990. Um, the Florida Health Department reported through. AIDS surveillance, uh, a young woman um, who later identified herself as Kimberly Brigalis, who was about 21, who, who had AIDS. And um, she was interviewed by experienced uh, investigators, and they couldn't find any risks. I mean, they, she did not acknowledge any risks, and, the, and they and it just turned out that they also happened to know that her dentist also had AIDS, because this was Florida. And so they sent the HIV strains from the patient and the dentist to CDC in Atlanta for the, the molecular virologist to analyze them. And compare them. This was a relatively novel technique they had of sequencing and comparing. And they found that they were essentially the same strain and that this, this, this couldn't have been, it's unlikely to be coincidence, couldn't a 99 point million or whatever. Well, so, so the question was, like this, this first became known, I guess it was around June 1990, so what are we going to do? And I remember going to a meeting. I mean, Jim Kern was a small, crowded room when, you know, what, what to make of this? I mean, and people went over the results and over the, I mean, everything. And, the, and the, there was just this, you know, people, you know, were like quiet and then shouting and then quiet again. And the realization was sinking in that, you know, she might have gotten infected from the dentist, she just went to get her wisdom teeth out, and what could this mean? And so, the, what to do next? Well, CDC had to publish this quickly, because really, uh, there was no additional information we were going to get anytime soon that was going to change this. We had the experienced investigators, we had the HIV strains, we had the... And then we had to have a process to lead the discussion as to, you know, get, like, what, what are we going to recommend? What are we going to recommend? And boy, was that a firestorm. I mean, it, it turned out, actually, that five patients were infected in that practice, not just one. But the, the problem was that the, the dentist died and the practice was closed. So in terms of an investigation as to how this happened, that became difficult. Um, uh, Harold Jaffe, Dr. Was, was really the one who directed, he and his colleagues, Dr. Carol Sazelski and some others, directed the investigation. Uh, my role was more, was the, the development of the recommendations. Like, what are we going to do about this? Well. 
so immediately the two sides there was the public uproar i mean you can imagine this this you know young woman and she died she you know she died you get aids from the dentist like you know there were people who who said uh and and in fact um that all all healthcare workers should be tested and positive ones should not be allowed to practice or at least not practice any type of invasive procedures. Um, on the other hand, there were people and, you know, these were AIDS groups and public health groups who were concerned about all this attention and resources devoted to this issue and, and they felt like um, the risk was negligible and there was a very high risk that these infected healthcare workers, who were mostly gay, as a matter of fact, would be discriminated against. And they felt like all we should do was to just say, you know, reinforce infection control precautions, and that's all you need to do. Well, then the politicians started getting involved. The Senate actually passed a bill in the Senate providing jail terms for healthcare workers who, infected healthcare workers who did invasive procedures without um, getting patient consent. And, and so- Did uh, it pass? It passed the Senate. Wow. Yeah, it died in the conference or something. But I mean, it, this was, so, so, so we actually, okay, so <laughs> we actually um, were quite convinced that for the vast majority of healthcare workers, even if they were infected, there was no risk they would transmit to patients. From what we knew, we were convinced. Even the ones who did invasive procedures, we were convinced that the vast majority of the risk was negligible. Yeah, they maybe need to be sure about their techniques. Stuff. But we, we had reason to believe that the risk wasn't negligible in every situation. And so we were not willing to just say, oh, just follow recommended procedures and that's all you need to do. We knew the limitations of those recommendations. We also had information that um, there's another bloodborne virus, hepatitis B, um, which is present in the blood at much higher levels than HIV. So it, it's not the same risk, but there were many well-documented episode situations where HIV-infected surgeons had transmitted to patients. Um, and, I'm sorry, HPV, hepatitis, hepatitis yeah. B, v, many. And the risk was higher during certain types of procedures. And there were no, uh, observe violations or in infection control. I mean, sometimes the guy wore double gloves. There was a super spreader phenomenon. Some didn't transmit any to any patients. Some transmitted to multiple patients. It was a lot understood, but, but it was enough to like give us pause in terms of just saying, oh, you know. Um, we also knew from our observation studies that I mentioned earlier that after a surgeon got injured in the operating room or stuck with a bone fragment or something, a third of these, there was something, um, I forget, I mean, 50, 80 of these witnessed by our trained observer, witnessed the, the needle recontacted the patient after sticking the surgeon. And this, this happened at like, you know, including attending surgeons, it wasn't just trainees. I mean, so, so we were not willing to just say, oh, okay, were so you, were what you, did we say? Were you surprised that this emerged from a dental practice? From, <laughs> was that, uh, had hugely. that even been considered during looking at, during observational studies? Not by, no, not really. We, we were not hugely surprised, to be honest with you. Um, uh, we, we had a uh, um, 
there was a group of, of dental officers here at CDC. There was a, a, a dental unit and uh, um, dental epidemiologists. And we did have this sense that, as in many outpatient settings, I, 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 I want to take care, that we, you know, not to just like, you know, stigmatize dentists here, but many outpatient settings were, were just like freestanding operations. There was no hospital infection control practitioner to go around and make sure things were done right and the latest recommendations were followed. We're talking about a private office somewhere. Mm -hmm. There's no. So dentists, they were all in this category. Okay. So we actually would, you know, not enormously astonished, let's put it this way, okay. that this might have happened in a dental office. But, okay, so that's a good question because, because people like so, this, this is where people, based on their fears, their legitimate fears, they wanted the outcome of our recommendations to be one way or the other, mm -hmm. and they, you know, like did everything they could to try and, I mean, accuse us, influence us. I mean, we got sort of, including from people I, I would have to say should have known better, who, who were like our, our, you know, sort of more traditional colleagues and friends were, were sort of, uh, <laughs> we, we got, Pressures. Let's just say pressures to 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 either just say nah, no problem, or to you know restrict all of them, and we tried to figure out like some kind of way forward here. And I'll tell you what we did. This went through more than a hundred drafts. Wow. It took a year, um, <laughs> and we ended up with a state of recommendations that said. Um, clearly exonerated the vast majority of healthcare. Like, we're not talking about phlebotomists here or anybody, and even invasive procedures. But we said, it, it didn't work in the end, I'll, I'll just say, but I'll, I'll, let me tell you what, what we tried to do. Um, we tried to say there's certain, based on the information we have about hepatitis B and other studies, the, certain procedures we'll just call exposure prone. Um, in those days, you know, if I just mentioned one of the procedures that was highly associated with hepatitis B transmission from surgeon to patients and also in our observational studies was highly associated with injuries that, um, and then recontact um, with the surgeon's blood was, was a, a procedure called, it was called vaginal hysterectomy. So it was the hysterectomy done by the vaginal, this is before laparoscopic surgery stuff. I mean, the, the problem also went away. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But the, the surgeon would feel where the tip of the suture needle was uh, with, with his finger. Like, he, he couldn't see it. It was blind suturing. Well, of course, that's going to, you know, what, what, so, so there were t things like that that, um, we, we said certain procedures, or we'll just call them exposure prone, uh, professional societies should designate which they are, and people who do those procedures should voluntarily get themselves tested and voluntarily. And if they're positive, they should seek advice from an expert review committee that involved somebody who knew about the procedures they did and their medical condition and stuff like that. And if the, if the expert review committee said it was okay, then it, it was okay. Or maybe they shouldn't do certain procedures or, 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 or something like that. That was, and this took 100 drafts and um, a year. And, and this was all ready to be, in fact, it was all printed in the MMWR, ready to, ready to mail out, you know, whatever, 100,000 copies, I don't know, whatever. Then the instruction came down from Washington. You're going to add a sentence. And the sentence you're going to add is that the patient has to consent to this, regardless. Like, e even if the expert c review committee says it's okay or don't do this procedures, it, the, the patient 
has to be informed oh. that the surgeon or whoever is HIV positive and has to consent. Well, this just like blew away the house of cards we had tried to build up because, I mean, p patients, you know, whatever you think, uh, well, let me just say, whatever you think of the merits or not of that, it did blow away our house of cards because it, it meant that, well, the, 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 the surgeons or the confidentiality was gone. I mean, if you had, that patient knew he was positive, so would everybody else. And it, it, it meant the whole thing was just not work. So, so, so the, the 100,000, whatever, MMWs are already been printed, they had to be shredded. And new, adding that sentence that came, I, I, I was told who it came from, but I'll just say uh, higher ups in Washington. And, well, so, so then we were really, and then Congress did pass a law that um, all states have to uh, adopt CDC, these CDC recommendations or they're gonna lose the public health funding. That actually passed, passed, signed. Well, so then we were left with a situation of these completely unworkable recommendations. Oh, also I'd say the professional societies refused to designate or declined to designate which procedures were exposure prone. They said they couldn't do that. Why, why would that be? They said it depended on the technique of the surgeon oh. and they couldn't do it. Um, and, and I think there's, yeah. you know, I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. Right. Um, but, 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 but anyway, um, um, so Congress passed a law that, so we were stuck, Congress had passed a law that all the states had to adopt our unworkable recommendations or lose their public health funding. So, so the states had to submit to us copies. So the, the lawyers here just, just approved all. This, this, uh, they're all, you know, <laughs> except maybe if, if there was a confidentiality issue. They said, no, you need to fix that. But So, so, all, so uh, the lawyers here reviewed the, the state yeah. uh, guidelines? Is that what you... Yeah, policies, policies. Uh, it was supposed to be done. Uh -huh. Now, eventually... So were the policies following the draft? Uh, what was then the CDC's position on what the policies needed to state? Oh, there were a couple of elements that had to be mentioned, and confidentiality of patients and workers had to be assured. Uh, but no, the, the, but the, bottom the, line the, but the was, patient was not to be informed. No, no, we didn't say, no, no. And, and, the, and the states were stuck too. They didn't, they knew this was on. So they, they put in like some general stuff and you know, we, we, we just signed it. And it, Did CDC ever come out with guidelines? Revised guidelines? Mm -hmm. That was considered, you, you know, I, this all happened um, this all happened during a Republican administration. Um, it's, it was actually Bush's father. I mean, so it was 90, 90, it was still, uh, I guess it was, Clinton was 92, as I recall. <laughs> So that you know, of course, that they were they tend to be the more liberal people, the the you know the like the, the congressman from Greenwich Village who was always like hammering us about something, how terrible these guidelines were. They were unworkable. When they got elected, you know, when the Democrats came in, there was an expectation that. They, the CDC, they, this would be reversed, and I was actually charged with like d drafting like what it could say to like how we would, you know, back away from this. And they decided they decided to leave it alone. They decided just leave it. Was anything ever published then in the MMWR? Oh yeah, the original guideline. You know, in nineteen. Um, but post Kimberly Brugalis. Yeah, well, yeah, these guide the, the recommendations for prevention of 
HIV and hepatitis B transmission to patients during invasive procedures. This was a full recommendation, I mean, a set of a recommendation report. Yeah, it was. This was the one that led to all this controversy. It had to be shredded to another sense. And then, but then it was rewritten. And how, how was it? Rewritten? It wasn't. It wasn't. We we, we 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 got we got early instructions to start doing this when the the, the Democratic administration came in, and once they realized the firestorm on both sides of this issue. They, they just said, leave it. Plus, the, the states had sort of taken care of it. It was going away. L let me tell you why it was going away. Okay. The issue was going away. For, for one thing, we, we did a bunch of, um, we call them kind of look back studies, like patients who had been um, treated by uh, had surgeons who were with AIDS and, or HIV infection, mostly AIDS. They were kind of too sick, some, but, but they didn't find any more. There was one more. Transmission found, this was in France, actually. It was an orthopedic surgery uh, transmitted to a woman during a long, but there, there weren't any more found. Mm. Um, uh, now, of course, that would have been hard to find. That doesn't mean they didn't happen, because these people didn't have any risks, and Kimberly Bugallis developed AIDS a little earlier than usual, mm. which was used to question her veracity by the mm -hmm. people who didn't want to believe it. Mm. Um, but still within a the range of them. And well, some, some things happened. For one thing, the surgeons and the dentists, the professional societies really cranked down. What, you know, the, I, I mean, in terms of fixing their techniques, you know, what do you mean recontacts? No, and we should, uh, never again. I mean, this, and the, you know, you don't do these things, the, the, the blind suturing and. Um, Was it ever the, assessed? what the likely source of transmission in the dental office? Couldn't, f f couldn't find out, it was closed. There were people, and this was a little other thing, there were people who wanted to believe that this was sloppy, you know, it was a sterilization or disinfection problem. Now, what, the dentist that died in the office was closed, but the, the technicians, who, or maybe that he'd done it intentionally, it was kind of a, there were all these uh, people who just wanted desperately to believe that this didn't really happen, you know, or that it was sloppy technique or, st and I guess in the end that can never be completely proven, but the, but, but the, um, one investigator told, the, the hygienists and the office staff wouldn't believe any, they said no. Um, one investigator said, you know, when we mentioned this to the hygienists, they started laughing. I mean, no, of course they wouldn't, you know, this wouldn't, the, they saw what was going on, it was the recommended, there was no like egregiously sloppy anything, and you know, so, but, it, but people wanted so much to believe this. We'd find, we'd find like experts in something like stating that this had happened, who knew nothing about the investigation, mm. nothing. But they'd be luminaries out there stating that they had inside sources, knew, and then somebody else would say, and then they'd cite each other to confirm it. And pretty, you know, some of these were like our, you know, like normally our friends who were, you know, they figured we were under pressure, which in the end it turned out we were under some, but they were worried about, the, the, the pressure from the sort of right wing, but they also had their views too. And anyway, it was, um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, so, so then when the administration changed and it was Democratic administration, like from, you know, these folks, ah, oh, finally, we'll get this all taken care of. And I was starting to, and then the message came down. No, forget it. Uh, and, oh, I know why it started to go away. So the surgeons, um, I'll just quote unquote saying they cleaned up their procedures and dentists. Um, anti, good antiretroviral therapy came along, like triple therapy. So you could get an infected surgeon dentist viral load down to undetectable. So, so that, you know, took a lot of the risk and the concern away. Uh, plus, uh, m malpractice insurance and hospital credentialing you know, started to deal with this on their own. And surgeon then, it's, you know, actually, you know, started to voluntarily started narrowing their practices because they didn't want to transmit either. So sort of a combination of all these things, the, the problem went away. But, did in the, a, but it was did HIV, something. HIV-infected healthcare workers yeah. um, 
started looking after themselves in terms of getting treated? How did how did it go away? Um, no, I mean the, the, the how did the, this uh, the question as a public away? health yeah. issue went away. Because it subsided of treatment? because of, there was there was better treatment. The, Surgeons and you know they paid more attention to their technique. The dentists particularly went to town, um, you know, on their their outpatient uh, infection control and education and getting people with up to and um, and and it did turn out that this you know was really rare based mm. on what and all the subsequent studies we could do. Fascinating. Well, it's, it, was, it was very times. illuminating. The whole thing was, I mean, I guess I really took away, there's all of this, you know, you really, I guess a few sort of, we, we really need the data. I guess that's one, if scientific, you know, we need to make our recommendations based on scientific data. It means we really need the data. It, it, it happened you know, surprisingly, a little too often that people were reluctant to see a study done because they were afraid of what the results might show. On either side, well, well, well-meaning people, I might, mind you, I'm not, but, but you, you have to punch through that somehow and get, because if you don't have the data, not, not of course, it has to be a well-designed study, but I mean, then you, then you really, just listen to people shouting at each other and you know. And sometimes we have to make recommendations based on limited data. I mean, just, just like a clinician sometimes has to do something even though he or she's not totally sure what the patient has. You, 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 have to, you can't just wait, you have to like, sometimes we have to like, there's, we have to do. And then, you know, so you just get the best advice you can from experts, stakeholders, even the public, their perspective. and. And then you say, well, here, here's what we're recommending based on what we know. And then you try to get more data and you say, well, you know, we'll change the recommendations as they go along. But you, you need the data. You need to be able to change. And, and it, I think the AIDS wars, <laughs> some, if you could you know, really demonstrate the importance of that. And, when you look back on it, do you... Um how do you feel as, as you look back on those years and the work that you were doing? Well, it was exhilarating. Uh, I don't think I could do it again. <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, but I, I, I knew why I went to work every morning. I mean, it, it, it was to try and help healthcare workers, patients, uh, you know, country to make some like what and um, I had good people to work with I was CDC you know the people I was lucky enough to work with uh, were wonderful we had collaborators have been alluded to um, expert consultants we had good leadership Jim Curran Harold Jaffe um, I felt uh, person. I felt empowered. I felt like no matter what was coming down around me, that I might have to like answer some question from a hostile audience, which happened fairly regularly, uh, or or draft some, or like help or meet in the CC director's office. I felt like my own personal leadership and the leadership above was supportive like they like they were supporting our work and i didn't have to worry about them you know and that was huge did you ever have to testify before congress or yeah actually twice um, um how was that one, <laughs> uh that was also an experience i i um one in particular, um, well, there were there was there were a number of congressional hearings on this, and um, 
uh, on these issues over the years. Um, one, and, and of course they, you know, they tend to have, they tend to come at it from different directions. And, and you know, I get a lot of coaching from uh, our Washington office and others here as to, you know, give, give me the background for this. And, and um, uh, but w one of them in particular, I remember, it was, it was really, uh, it, um, it was chaired by um, Ron Wyden, who was a congressman at the time from Oregon, a uh, Democrat, and it was, um, I guess the, the genesis was unions were, um, uh, the healthcare worker unions, I mean, they were quite active and interested in this and, and um, uh, quite supportive, actually. Um, their concern was maybe we were understating things, but, but I mean, they, they, had, they had good people. And um, a anyway, um, so uh, there was a hearing on, on, on risks, but really, you know, the safer needle device type thing and what more could be done, the government, OSHA. I mean, that, that was kind of what this hearing was about. And uh, um, it, it, it was amazing. I mean, there were, there were 11 TV cameras in the uh -huh. hearing room. I mean, this this was, and it started with a uh, a woman who'd gotten AIDS from an occupational exposure, testifying behind a screen, so you couldn't see her face, and she recounted the injury and the awful, just, um, I actually did happen to, like, see her later. I got a peek of her as she was leaving and saw her, in the cafeteria, and I didn't say a word, but she just was so gaunt and thin. Mm. I mean, it was heartbreaking. I mean, just this happened to you on the job from a... I mean. And then there was a guy who, um, he was from a laundry room, and he emptied onto the, uh, uh, the witness table a big bag of sharp instruments that he said were recovered in the laundry, you know, which I don't doubt it. I mean, we heard, we, we heard this thing. Uh, and they had... Um, Oh, well, then at one point we were up there. I, 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 so with CDC, FDA, and OSHA, uh, we, the three of us were together, and you know they said, "Well, uh, now we're, we'll hear from the administration witnesses." And I was like, "No, well, I'm wait a minute. I'm a scientist here. I'm not the administration." <laughs> but the, you know, somebody from the Washington office said, "No, no, they, they just that's the way they refer to you." Don't take it personally so anyway so we talked and I mean it was you know it was pr pretty sympathetic and but it, it, this really did get a lot of uh, a lot of attention and it spilled into arenas that I don't know was quite an experience mm -hmm. well you sure have have had a, a fascinating career on this um, did you ever worry that you would get AIDS during all of this, or that your family might? Well, I did, you know, a medical, I mean, we, we did have clinical, um, uh, what's the word for it? I worked at Grady. Um, I, I did some clinical duties to kind of keep, keep in touch with reality. And um, I, I didn't actually worry, because I, because I knew how it was transmitted and how it wasn't. So, so I didn't actually worry, worry. Um, but I, I could, like, you know, stuff occurred to me when things were happening. Mm -hmm. like, uh, this, mm -hmm. this, uh, I know my family. No, no because, I mean, we uh, well. Anything you'd like to add before we finish? I don't know. I, I just think it's really a blessing. You know, at CDC is a really a, it's it's a wonderful organization. And when you have good leadership, it can just do wonderful things. Um, it is a government agency. We do have masters in Washington and 
supervised by people who the taxpayers elect to supervise us because we're spending their money. Um, and I don't know, you know, the dynamics, but we, we, we do need to have enough independence to, like, do what the scientific data seem to indicate to us. There is a way, you know, there's some amount. Now, sometimes, I guess, higher-ups, I spent a year at Health and Human Services. They have a very different perspective. I mean, they have a... You know, they have a ship to run up there in Washington. I mean, we're down here, the scientists, and they got, you know, they have to fight the political battles that I just sort of mentioned and complained about. And so they, you know, no, there are no villains here, but it's, we, we do have to, like, f be able to maintain some independence and credibility. And, you know, when, I guess when, you know, that, after spending a year working on those recommendations to, to see them shredded for them to put in a sentence that can't fit. I mean, I don't know if the recommendations would have been workable anyway, probably not, but, but it just was kind of like, no, you, you didn't need to do that. Oh. Anyway, it's a, great, it's a great place. Thanks so much, David. Okay, thank you.